Hi, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of The Biz, the Business Integrity School. And I am super excited today to tell you that I have with us ECI's Chief Executive Officer, Pat Harned. Welcome, Pat. Thank you for having me, Cindy. It's great to see you. It's great to see you too. Pat and I go back a ways, uh, but let me tell the rest of the audience uh, a little bit about Pat so you can get to know her as well. So as I mentioned, she is the CEO of the of ECI, which is the Ethics and Compliance Initiative. And the ECI is an industry organization whose mission it is to empower organizations to build and sustain high quality ethics and compliance programs. And as the CEO, Pat oversees all of ECI's strategy and operations. She also directs outreach efforts to policymakers and federal enforcement agencies in Washington, DC. And she speaks and writes frequently as an expert on ethics in the workplace, corporate governance, and global integrity. Pat chaired the ECI's Blue Ribbon Panel on High Quality Ethics and Compliance Programs, which established a new industry standard for effective ethics and compliance uh, efforts and organizations. She's testified before Congress and the U.S. Sentencing Commission, and she's provided briefings to the U.S. Secretary of Defense and the OSHA Whistleblower Protection Advisory Committee. Pat's also been featured um, as recently as just yesterday, <laughs> given the day of our recording in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which was great to see in the op-ed page, um, the Washington Post, USA Today, and CNN. Pat holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Education from Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania, Master's of Education degree from Indiana University, and a Doctorate in Philosophy Education from the University of Pittsburgh. Quite an accomplished uh, resume there, Pat. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> I am excited. Pat and I, when I mentioned in the intro that we go way back, um, Pat has been the uh, CEO of ECI for quite a while. And I had the great fortune of serving on the board of um, ECI for, for many, many years. And um, we got to work a lot together in, uh, in that capacity. And I still am a big fan of ECI's work and conferences. And that's one of the reasons that we are hosting the podcast today is because ECI is, has just released um, some very uh, interesting research, which they do every couple of years, I think, and have been for the last 20 years. It's called the Global Business Ethics Survey. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing it since 94. This year, you're able to share with the audience some insights in the US from over 20 years. And um, we did make it global a few years back, about five years now. So we also yes. have some global insights. Right. Uh, and it covers, I think, about 10 countries. But share just a little bit more, Pat, for our audience who may not be familiar with this really significant uh, research project, what it really is, what countries are in, and uh, what it's all about. So I know that I'm talking to an academic audience, so which is always fun because I get to lean a little more on some of the statistics of this study. This is a longitudinal cross-sectional study of employees in workplaces around the world. When it was first created in 1994 and actually through to about 2016, it was actually only a US survey. And that was largely because of ECI's methodologies, uh, ability to sample, ability to have access to more global panel methodologies. But so starting in 2016, we switched to a global survey, which yeah. means that this time around, as you mentioned, Cindy, it's in 10 different countries, Mexico, Brazil, France, Germany, Spain, the UK, China, India, and Russia and the United States. Yeah. Um, so it is, it's done by panel. Uh, we surveyed this time 14,000 employees representing those countries, and they represent the business workforce in each of those countries. Um, and to be able to qualify to be a part of the survey, you had to be at least 18 years old and, uh -huh. and working at least 20 hours a week in a business organization. The, and and that, those organizations had to have at least two employees. We do oversample to represent large organizations. And that's largely because the, the audiences that tend to rely on this, this research um, come from medium and large size organizations. So we oversample to represent them. But when you look at how people are spread across the panels, it actually is a very good representation of what business looks like around the world. 
Yeah. Well, it has certainly become, um, I would say, something that people in the industry wait for every two years to see what some of the new trends are. Uh, and I love the fact that now we can talk about 20 years worth of trends in the U.S. and five internationally. So let's dive in now. Sure. Just some of the main findings and yeah. um, what the trends have shown. The first one, uh, I think, is around strength of companies cultures. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess my question is, I I think everybody can assume it's good to have a strong uh, culture. Uh, But have you seen that in this year's uh, study? Did it go up or did it go down from previous years? And what insights did you draw from that? Sure. And just to add uh, one other point of information about the survey. So we actually, and Cindy, you're correct, for many, many years, we surveyed every other year. But in starting in 2016, we started oh. to survey every year. Every However, year. We only do an update on trends with those questions every other year. So, okay. even though, um, so we have not actually reported on trends since 2017. So this has been a little bit longer this time in the update. All that said, you are correct. One of the, there are generally a couple of metrics that we gauge every time when we want to update what is the state of ethics in workplaces around the world. And culture is a very important one. For us, it's a roll up of a series of questions that we ask. Um, and, and of course, in the ethics and compliance industry, it's one we care about a great deal because we know culture has such a huge impact on people's conduct. Yes, and so we, we always hope that we will see a, an uptick when we're looking at how many people say they work in organizations with a strong ethical culture. This time, we actually saw it plateau. So mm-hmm. in 2017, about one in five people said they worked in a strong culture. It remained exactly the same in the U.S. this time around. Um, And so we do report both globally and based on the U.S. data, because we have more data and longer data in the U.S., we tend to drill down a little more in that. Um, So it's not the highest we've ever seen. The highest we ever saw it was in 2009 when 24% of people said they worked in strong cultures. So a little bit of a dip, but not, not as much as you might think, given all that has been going on when we were fielding this survey. We fielded yeah. it in the middle of the COVID crisis. Oh, goodness. So, um, and, and we actually delayed it this time because we we'll ask a lot of questions about what have you observed in the last 12 months? And we wanted to be able to ask people about the difference in the COVID environment versus before the COVID environment. Yeah, so. yeah, very interesting. So it plateaued. Um, and is that trend just a U.S. plateau that you saw, or was it a global plateau? It's actually a global plateau. Okay. It's a global plateau. And what's interesting is that, I mean, if you look at individual countries, of course, there, there are some significant differences. In sure. India, 28% of people said they worked in a strong culture, 25% in Brazil, which is an interesting finding. But when you look at year over year for all of those countries, it tends to be about fairly consistent. And I think the hard thing about that is that only one in five people say they work in a strong ethical culture, which is yeah. a finding. Yeah. We want it to be more. Yeah. So why do we want it to be more? Why, why is it so important for employees to feel like they're working in a company with a strong ethical culture? The last, well, I think it was 2016, we leveraged the GBES research to try to look at what is the impact of an ethics and compliance program, but also what is the impact of a culture on conduct in an organization. And the findings were really striking. One of the things we learned is that when employees work in a strong culture, they are 546% more likely to say that they're seeing certain really positive outcomes. They're not seeing as much misconduct. If they are, they're willing to report it. They believe their leadership is committed to the core values and standards of their organization. The amount of retaliation drops significantly. Yeah. So it, it's a there's a huge benefit for organizations if they can reach a place where employees say, ethics really matters here. Our values really matter here. The standards are important and people are held accountable. 
Yeah. So yeah, it's 546% increase over. That is huge. It is huge. It is huge. And uh, um, unfortunately the plateau this year, which again, remember that's, it's only one in five. And so there's a lot of room to still grow here for companies, I think is the main takeaway. Absolutely. So, and you know, I wonder if, if COVID actually may have had an impact on that um, with respect to maybe not making any forward progress, um, which is a whole nother topic <laughs> right. about how do right. you maintain a strong culture when you're, when you can't all be together. And so much of that, I think is human and personal interactions. I think you're probably right. And I also, one of the things that we do know is that the more an organization does to invest in an ethics and compliance program, the more likely their employees are to say they work in a strong culture. And it's probably fair to say that most organizations didn't jettison their ethics and compliance programs because we had a COVID crisis. But because there were economic challenges, we did start to see companies really having to figure out how to do more with less and making changes in their workforce. And it could be that part of the reason we saw culture plateau is that programs are plateauing, but it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Yeah, we'll have to watch that one. Yeah. Yeah. Excited now for the for the next uh, right. survey. It's a trend to watch. <laughs> right. so let's turn uh, let's turn to another another trend and and um, finding that's really important as well as culture is pressure that employees may feel to skirt around uh, the an organization's sort of ethical standards. Yes. So, what did your survey this year find on employee pressure? Has as that increased or decreased? It's increased and it's increased significantly. In in the history of this study, pressure has always been one of those metrics that sort of, it doesn't change a whole lot. You know, if we see a six or seven percentage point change, we think we get excited because we think that's a lot. This time there was actually a 14 percentage point difference, which doing the math, it's a 47% increase in the number of employees who said they feel pressure to compromise standards to do their jobs. And the reason we worry about that is that there's a very high connection between the extent to which people feel pressure and the extent to which misconduct actually happens in their workplace. Mm -hmm. 96% of employees who feel pressure also say, I've observed some kind of wrongdoing happening around me. So in other words, it's kind of a where there's smoke, there's fire, where there's pressure, there's misconduct. So the fact that we're seeing so many people, 30% of employees, a third of the workforce said, I feel like I have to cut corners to do my job right now, which is a troubling finding. It is. So um, let me ask you, is it the same in the U.S. as it was globally, that that trend? So the trend actually, it did go up globally. And again, there are differences by country. Some countries saw far yeah. more than others did, but, but almost across the board, yes, countries okay. globally, the workforce everywhere in the world is feeling this pressure. What does the rate of observed misconduct really mean and why is that important? So we ask people in the last 12 months, have you observed something that you consider to be a violation of your company's standards or a violation of the law? And then we actually will ask a series of questions about types of wrongdoing that people are observing. And we calculate based on, when you ask the question outright, have you observed misconduct in the last year? About half as many people say yes to the question. But if you come at a different, from a different angle and say, have you observed environmental violations or somebody Uh who's punching the financial statements or Uh abusive behavior in the workplace? the numbers go up exponentially. So this year, almost half of employees, 49% of employees said they've observed some kind of behavior that constitutes misconduct, a violation of standards, a violation of of the law. Um, And the reason, of course, I mean, every business leader out there is worried about some type of wrongdoing happening out there in operations that they're not aware of not being reported, that's not being tended to, that will eventually blow up in their face. And so that is why this measure of misconduct is an important one. 
one. Right. Um, what, what's interesting is that when we look at the trends over time, um, misconduct didn't change much in the last couple of, it has not moved a whole lot. And it's hard to know what, what do we make of that. Um, but I, but I do think it is, it's still troubling. Half of all people every year will say, I've seen something that my business leaders probably would be worried about. Yeah. And, and just because they've seen it doesn't mean that they're reporting it. So back to, that's why it's really important to get a sense of how many people are saying they've observed it and then companies can go and look at, well, what percentage of our employees are we hearing from about observed misconduct? What's the delta kind of between those two? And then what can we do to improve it? Okay, one one more, the fourth, and I think really important kind of trend to watch is retaliation and whether or not employees are fearful of retaliation um, when they do report. So we talked about observed misconduct. We know not everybody reports. There's a big delta between that. And so then you got to look at why. And one of the questions and one of the main reasons for not reporting is concern over retaliation. So what did this year's report say about uh, employees' concern for retaliation? Is that up or down? It is way up. And in fact, if anything, it it followed the pattern of pressure. So we saw a 44% increase in the number of people who said they saw wrongdoing, reported it somehow to management, and then experienced retaliation for having done so. So 79% of employees who reported some kind of observed misconduct experienced retaliation for having come forward, which That's is... True alarming. It is alarming. One of the things it, our center is, we've done some research around this, but there's also been a number of other research studies that have shown that retaliation is actually sort of a leading indicator of what direction your culture is heading. It, once you start mm -hmm. to have an environment where employees feel like I can't come forward and report wrongdoing, right. suddenly everything starts to change. So that increase is huge and it is very, very worrisome. Yeah, it's an early indicator of not having what people would refer to as a speak up culture where Correct. they feel like they can just speak up without, uh, without any concern. Yes. Wow, okay, so increase in pressure, increase in concerns for retaliation. Both of those are important signals, I think, for us to watch yes. because the other two just plateaued in terms of observed misconduct and, and strong ethical cultures, so. Correct. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. And, and globally, so there are some countries where the retaliation numbers were even more alarming. In India, for example, oh wow, ninety percent of employees who reported wrongdoing said that they have, they experienced retaliation for it. Ninety percent, which is unbelievable. And Germany, seventy three percent. So there are some countries that really sort of stand out as having had significant shifts. Um, but, and again, it's, it's a common pattern around the world that retaliation is on the rise and it is, mm -hmm. it is worrisome. Mm -hmm. How much of, do, do you happen to know how much of an increase that was in India over the last time? 90% is really high. So it actually, in 2019, it was 86%. So not as big a jump, but in 2015, 74%. I was about to say only 74%, yeah. but 74% <laughs> right. cool. is not great. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Definitely a, moving in the wrong direction. Number. Wow. Okay, so so with all of that as background, um, all of that great research and, and your background as an educator, um, I would like to know what you think um, are some of the most important things that business schools should be focusing on with their young students who are soon to be business managers in what I would call a very turbulent business world and one that I don't think is going to change in that regard. What are some of the most important things for business schools to focus on to prepare their students? So the first thing I would say is it's very important for, for students to be focusing on, first of all, how frequently misconduct is taking place in the business world, because it is no, it's not that you might encounter at some point in your career a problem where you might need to worry about is this a violation. It's, it's a matter of when. <laughs> and every student 
in a business school will eventually experience or observe some type of wrongdoing in their job, no matter. And for a lot of us, the longer we're in our careers and moving to different businesses, it's not just once, it's multiple times it, throughout your career, ethics issues are going to be a part of your professional life. And so, so it, I think it's critical for business schools to be helping students to recognize violations, to understand the importance of them, the impact, not just in terms of fines and legal issues for companies, but the impact on culture, on employee yeah. engagement. Yeah. Um, and then I think the other part of it too, there's been some great research by folks, I think whom you've even interviewed, Cindy, in your series, like Mary Gentili yeah. and others who have, who have talked a lot about the more students while they're in school can be focusing on how do I learn to voice my concerns? How do I practice reporting? The more likely when you're in that instance, you'll be able to handle it effectively. So, so I, I would just, I would say that those are probably two very critical things, but also I know people in business schools, you want to be, you're not just trying to get a job and do something related to business. You want to be a leader. You want to be in the C-suite or CEO and there are an awful lot of CEOs out there now who have not fully grasped the importance of culture and tone at the top, the actions of managers and the impact that has on their organization. And so the ability for students to come out of school and be able to be articulate about that, that it's not just about, I wanna be a successful leader, leader in driving performance in my business, but I want to help build a strong ethical culture and knowing how you do that. Those are great skills to be learning now. Yeah, I, I would have to agree uh, that those are. And, you know, there was a, some recent findings, actually, um, in the Financial Times. There was a, a recent um, opinion piece by um, former McKinsey partner who talked about um, still that business schools aren't focusing enough on those kinds of skills um, to complement the hard skills like, you know, the finance and the accounting and the marketing, but knowing how to operate effectively in the workplace to build strong ethical cultures is, is really important. It's been hard. I, I, in one of my past lives was in higher education and I know how difficult it is to weave those kinds of things into the curriculum yeah. because they're soft skills. Nobody right. really, you, you do need to know accounting, you need to know finance, you need to know all sorts of things, but but how to actually incentivize people to care about integrity, how to be communicating your commitment to core values, what core values are, those are things that if we don't figure out how to integrate them across the business school curriculum, we're gonna to continue to see the same problems. Very talented business leaders who are great at driving their business from a performance perspective, but, but struggling a bit when it comes to how do I get my arms around the culture and why things are happening the way they are. Yeah. So they're very good at what they're doing, but how they're doing it isn't as strong and both need to be equally, equally strong. Yep. All right. So let me ask you one other question because you, you have been an educator in your um, past life and you've been involved in the ethics and compliance, compliance industry for many, many years now. And you've seen a lot of the changes, um, many for the positive, I would say, in our industry as it continues to grow and has grown over the last 20, 25 years. So if you had a crystal ball and you were able to look into the future and predict what you think the future of business ethics is and, and should be, what would the three words be that you would use to describe the future of business ethics? Three words. So I, I would say central to a business or maybe a better word would be essential. Um, I, I continue to think that business ethics is going to be challenging for businesses. Um, and I'll come back to why I am using that word because it feels like an easy word, easy way out with a word, um, but also diverse. I, at least I hope it will be diverse. So in, in looking at 20 years of research for partially for this report in 1994, when we were doing this study, yes. we defined an ethics and compliance program as having a code, having a helpline and doing some training on 
values somehow. And when you think about now, what goes into an ethics compliance program, if only it were that simple. Right. Not only because the regulatory and enforcement environment has gotten so involved in defining what a program should look like from risks identification to everything else, but I actually think looking forward, the movement that's happening right now in ESG investing, the conversation about investors and um, even now internally, <clears throat> excuse me, in businesses, the need for businesses to not only think about what are the products we're making or the services we're providing, but what is our what is our impact environmentally, socially, and in terms of how we're doing it from a governance perspective. Yes. I think that is going to reshape business ethics because so much of it is also grounded in people's willingness to comply with expectations about how we're going to be carrying out the business. Um, and so that's why I was thinking essential is an appropriate word. Mm -hmm. um, I also think I want to say that business ethics is going to be more diverse, both in its breadth in terms of um, not just focusing on employee conduct, but also probably increasingly actually communicating with shareholders because they're paying attention to what businesses are doing in this whole space. Right. But I also hope that as an industry, as a profession, we'll be more diverse in the, the people who are rising up in our field, who are becoming thought leaders. I think our, our profession is, is a little bit, we have a ways to go in really representing multiple perspectives, multiple backgrounds, multiple cultures and countries. Um, so, so I'm putting on, looking into my crystal ball, I hope that that's something that will really happen for us. Yeah, I think that's great. So, and the reason why I think those are really three great words for the future of business ethics is there's both this micro view of business ethics, a lot of what the Global Business Ethics Survey and those findings talk about, like the individual uh, in the moment, in the business, trying to work effectively, right? And then there's this macro view. Yes. which is the whole ESG and bringing both of those together and thinking 20, 25 years ago, we were focused on a very basic level of just this micro right. view, right? Mm -hmm. and, and now we, we've, we've made some progress there, still room to go, but there's this whole macro view uh, right. as well that has really come into focus that I think companies have, have really um, under, are beginning to understand and embrace Agreed. in a different way and, and puts, you know, kind of business ethics on a whole different platform in terms yep. of uh, what's going to be expected in the future. Agreed. So. And it's exciting. I think when I think about all the years of conferences we've had, you, you and I, we've been to lots of industry conferences in our time, in our, in our careers. It's exciting to see the conversation move from what is the Department of Justice emphasizing in their enforcement practices to at how do we demonstrate that we are genuinely committed yes. to what we're doing to the environment and how we're investing in communities and how does that play out in what we're telling our employees their role is in that. Right. To me, that's, that takes the work we do in ethics and compliance and it puts it in a whole new plane in the oh, way was it probably initially intended. <laughs> I would, agree. I would agree. I would agree. And it's really moving it from being this reactive, what do we need to do yes. to, you know, stay out of the crosshairs to this proactive stance, mm -hmm. um, which if you get in front of it, which is always what we've talked about, right? Getting in yes. front of issues. If you get there, you're actually really speaking uh, to the heart, I would say for a lot of people uh, in terms of things that they care about. And then you can, you can, can also work on, you know, the head part of it and explaining the whys. But when you capture both, it's a home run. So yep. Agreed. Agreed. Great, great findings in the report. Thank you for sharing those with us. Um, and thank you for talking about the future of business ethics and, and looking into your crystal ball. I always like to end these on three kind of fun questions. We've all been spending a lot more time indoors lately with COVID. So we've had a um, little more time on our hands to either read fun things or watch fun things or listen to some fun, interesting things. So what have you spent your time um, listening to reading or watching, or maybe one of all three for fun, but that you find also have this really interesting ethical dilemma to them. So I am, I'm not sure this is a great commentary about myself, but there have been a number of TV series that when the rest of the world was 
binge watching them, I wasn't paying attention. So I've been catching up on my binge watching. <laughs> As have a lot of us. <laughs> which is always fun. Um, but I also, you know, one of the things that I have wanted to do for quite a while, I really like photography and I'm really interested in macro photography, which is where you take pictures of objects and, you know, nature and flowers and things very close up. And so I've been challenging myself once a week to get out my camera and take pictures of things using my macro lens to try to get better at that skill and then editing and other things. And it's always just so interesting. There's a little ethics element to it because when you look at even the simplest object from a very different perspective, you see it so completely differently. You understand it so much better. And so, you know, I don't want to draw it too far, but but it is always interesting to me when you think back to situations and look at them from a different perspective, how you see um, values and the conduct and other things differently. So that's been sort of my little ethics ethics element of COVID. Yeah, that's kind of been your uh, your your COVID uh, hobby to get back into. That's right. And eventually, yeah. I'm going to launch a website that just has my pictures because somebody needs to see them now that I've taken so many. <laughs> that's awesome. that's yeah. great. Well, Pat, thank you so much for your time, for your insights today, and for sharing it with the audience. Really appreciate it, and it's been great to see you again. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you too, Cindy. All right. Talk soon. All right. And that's a wrap for another episode of The Biz. Join us next week when we will be uh, uh, interviewing and talking with another guest, and we look forward to seeing you back then. Bye-bye.